1570, Christian Europe was weak and divided. It was torn by religious wars and persecution. The Mohammedan Turks, the greatest enemy of disordered Europe, knew that it was time to attack. Now the Christians will be our slaves. They were encamped as close as the Greek city of Lepanto. Their fleet was in the harbor. Their plans were complete. The campaign was ready to go. The saintly Pope Pius V in Rome was the only leader who seemed aware of the danger. I appeal to you rulers, and you do not listen. There is nothing to worry about, Your Holiness. At long last, he persuaded Spain and Venice to join the Papal States and form a league. They would fight a holy war against the Turks to save Europe and Christianity from the invaders. Evil men were forbidden to take part in this holy crusade by Don John of Austria. Don John was the leader appointed by the Pope. Don John, with all his fighters, received the sacraments before the fleet sailed. At home, Pope Pius V ordered the rosary to be said everywhere, publicly and privately, and he urged processions and blessed sacrament devotions to be held. At sea, the fighters also said the rosary every day. The whole fleet was dedicated to Mary, Queen of the Holy Rosary. Enemies dead ahead! Lepanto Harbor, Sunday, October 7th. In the final tense moments before combat, once more the fighters prayed the rosary. It was an awful battle. Within five hours, the Turks were not only beaten, but most of their 300 ships were sunk. A great storm completed the destruction of the enemy, while the victorious Christian ships made for the shore. That same Sunday, October 7th, the Pope was meeting with cardinals hundreds of miles away in Rome. He had knelt in prayer all through the previous night. Suddenly, he stopped. <clears throat> Let us thank God that our forces have won a great victory over the Turks at Lepanto. How could he know? Electronic communications were undreamed of then. Two weeks later, a messenger from Lepanto reached the Vatican. He brought news of the victory that the Pope had miraculously learned the day it happened. Later, the next Pope, Gregory XIII, made this decree. In gratitude for the victory at Lepanto, the first Sunday of October shall henceforth be the feast of the Most Holy Rosary. The Most Holy Rosary of Mary, to whose use the victory at Lepanto was attributed, had existed as a devotion in the church for about 300 years before the battle. How did it begin? St. Dominic, the holy founder of the Dominican priests and brothers and sisters, is the one whom many popes have called the author or institutor of the rosary in its present form. During his life, early in the 1200s, untold damage was being done in France, not only to the church, but also to the state, by a terrible heresy called Albigensianism. It is evil, I tell you, evil, evil. The heretics evil. taught the people that everything material was evil, including the human body. Therefore, suicide was a good thing, and marriage was very wicked. And so, my people, you must listen. These errors are not pleasing to God. Dominic tried his best to turn the tide of this evil by his fervent preaching and saintly life, but he had very little success. Weary from the combat, he implored the Mother of God to show him how he could lead the misguided Albigenses back to the church. The tradition is that Mary herself appeared to Dominic in France and there revealed to him the rosary. Mary clearly showed Dominic that only if the people thought about the life and death and glory of her son, uniting with it the recitation of the Hail Mary, could the enemies of Christ be overcome. Mere physical force or even eloquent preaching could never succeed. This devotion, which you are to spread by your preaching, is a practice most dear to my divine son and me. It is a most powerful means of destroying heresy, overcoming vice, of encouraging virtue, imploring divine mercy, and obtaining protection. 
the faithful, will obtain many advantages through it, and they will always find me ready to aid them in their wants. A mere string of beads to count the Our Fathers and Hail Marys recited while thinking about the mysteries of our Lord's life and death. This simple weapon Dominic used at Mary's direction to convert so many thousands of heretics that the heresy disappeared and devotion to the rosary spread rapidly throughout the world. Historically, various means for counting repeated prayers had been used long before the time of St. Dominic. In the Garden of Gethsemane, our Lord himself showed the very human tendency to repeat favorite prayers by saying over and over for three hours the self-same prayer. Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass away from me, yet not as I will, but as thou willest. Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass away. Again from Calvary's cross, he kept on praying for his enemies over and over. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Father, forgive them, for they do not know. Pebbles were used by the early Christians to count the Our Fathers, which they repeated a certain number of times each day to keep a promise they had made. Later, they carried counters with them, which they made by threading berries on a string to make the counting easier. They call these strings paternosters, or Our Father beads, because of the Our Fathers they said on them. By the 12th century in Europe, they were saying Hail Marys over and over, and counting them on beads, just as they had done before with the Our Fathers. In the monasteries, the monks who were priests sang the divine office every day. This was made up of the 150 psalms of the Bible. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. But other monks who were not priests and who could not read and lay people at home used to recite 150 Hail Marys instead of saying the 150 psalms of the divine office. For this reason, the 150 bead rosary was often called the Psalter of Our Lady or sometimes the layman Psalter, since the 150 Hail Marys took the place of the 150 Psalms. But the division of the 150 beads into 15 decades, or groups of 10, separated by the large Our Father beads, was first indicated by Mary to St. Dominic. Mary divided the rosary as a means of teaching her children the truths of their religion which is nothing other than the wonderful story of God's love for them. She chose 15 of the most important events or scenes in her son's life, a part of the story of God's love for us. Mary asked that her children meditate on, that is, think about these events, while they say the Hail Marys of their rosary. Five of these events are called joyful, because they remind us of the joyful beginnings of God's great work of redeeming love for us sinners. Hail, full of grace, behold, thou shalt bring forth the Son. It all began at the first joyful scene when the angel Gabriel informed Mary that she was to be the mother of God's Son. God had promised to send him into the world to open the gates of heaven to us after Adam's sin had closed them. The second joyful scene took place when Mary visited her cousin Elizabeth, who was to be the mother of St. John the Baptist. How have I deserved that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, the moment that the... Thus, Elizabeth learned Mary's secret, that she was soon to give birth to the long-awaited Redeemer. The third joyful scene took place on the first Christmas night when God's Son was born into the world so that he could begin his work of redeeming us. The fourth joyful event found Mary offering her divine child to God in the temple. The prophet Simeon told her that a sword would pierce her own heart 
because while many would accept this child as the son of God and his love for them, yet many would reject him. The fifth joyful scene took place when Mary and Joseph, with great relief, found the Christ child in the temple after he had been tragically lost to them for three days. Five of the rosary events are called sorrowful because they recall to us the love of God shown to us by his terrible suffering and death, which bought us back from sin and Satan. The first sorrowful scene reminds us of our Lord's agony in the garden, when the horror of our sins made his sweat run as drops of blood. The second sorrowful event, or scene, reminds us of the lashing which our Lord suffered as part of the payment for the punishment due to our sins. The third sorrowful scene shows our Lord with thorns biting deep into his sacred head. Christ accepted this torture to pay for all our sins of thought. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. The fourth sorrowful event shows us Christ struggling up the hill of Calvary to pay the precious price of our redemption. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The fifth sorrowful event recalls Christ shedding the last drop of his blood to open the gates of heaven for us. Man did his worst to God, while God did his best for man. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The final five of the rosary events are called glorious because they recall the happy triumph of God's story of love for man. The first glorious scene recalls the resurrection when Christ conquered death and thus guaranteed our own bodily resurrection from the dead. The second glorious scene shows our Lord returning to heaven to prepare a place for us. He left behind his church to carry on his work of leading us to a happy reunion with him in heaven. The third glorious scene recalls Christ sending his Holy Spirit to enlighten his infant church, to keep it holy and free from error, and to enable it to sanctify us till the end of time. The fourth glorious scene recalls the wonderful assumption or taking up into heaven of Mary, body and soul. This reminds us that Christ will fulfill his promise to have us with him in heaven someday, body and soul, just as Mary is there now. The fifth glorious scene took place when Christ, the Son of God, crowned his mother, Mary, Queen of Angels and Men. His mother, Queen of Heaven, is waiting to welcome us at the end of our lives as followers of her son. These 15 scenes Mary specially selected to teach and constantly remind her children of the good news of God's love and his plan to have us with him forever. They are called the mysteries of the rosary. They are called mysteries of the rosary because although they are visible events, we can never understand their full meaning. How could God be born of a woman? How could God suffer and die? How could he love us so much? Mary chose all these scenes or mysteries because she wanted us to think about them and apply them to our own lives while we say her favorite prayer, the rosary, every day. Whenever we say the rosary, we speak to God with most of the principal prayers of our faith. While holding the cross, we begin by saying the Apostles' Creed, the I believe in God. In this prayer, we proclaim our belief in all the main truths that God teaches us through the church. On the short piece of chain before each large Our Father be, we honor the Most Holy Trinity. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. While holding the larger beads that separate each decade of ten smaller beads, we say the Our Father, the prayer our Lord himself taught us. We then say ten Hail Marys in succession, all the while as Mary asked us, meditating on or thinking about one of the scenes or mysteries of God's love for us. 
meditation is really easy and enjoyable. We can easily imagine each mystery as a little one-act play on a stage. And we know that when we go to see a play, we get a program. The program tells us the place and time of the play. And then it tells us who the actors are. And finally, when we have seen the play, then we know what they said and what they did. So when seeing the rosary plays in our mind, we should always imagine ourselves right in the play or mystery, taking part in it or looking on, learning the lesson that the play teaches us. We picture the scene. We ask ourselves, who was there? What did they do? What did they say? What would I have said or done if I were there? What is the lesson here for me? And all the while we keep on praising Mary and the Hail Marys, which we know so well by heart. How long do we meditate on one of these scenes? Just as long as it takes us to say ten Hail Marys, we think about ourselves as taking part in one of these mysteries. Thus, the rosary is an easy prayer for everyone. The greatest theologian or scientist can use all his mental powers on it. The simple, uneducated person can praise God just as well through the rosary. There was a little old invalid lady who used to say her rosary all day long with scarcely a break, even during the bad nights, too. And a visiting priest asked her, But doesn't it tire your head, Mother? Why, it's the grandest rest, dearie. I'm with the Blessed Mother of God the whole of the hours instead of being alone by myself. I go through it all slowly with her, only never forgetting that she and her beloved son can't suffer no more. Otherwise, them sorrowful mysteries would break my heart. But do you keep in touch with her all the time? She was not in the garden, you know, at the time of the agony. Oh, but she knew. She was on her knees somewhere, by her bed maybe, with her dear head bowed down on the window ledge. If there were pains and insults she didn't see or hear, you may be sure her love imagined them extra hard. Mothers are like that. At the ascension, I'm that foolish, I, I've often opened my arms ready for her to fall into when the last cloud has hidden him. Then I say, the Lord is with thee, firm as I can, sort of reminding her that her sorrows are all over. When he was among them doctors and when he was laid in the sepulcher, she must have felt she had lost him. But when I pray about those, I feel joyful because now she's safe with him forever. She's so grateful. And Father, so am I. <laughs> oh, the rosaries, a real rest for the old and hidden. Not only a real rest, but the rosary has also been a real safeguard for Christians all through the centuries since Mary gave it to us. And we all want safety and security. When a wise amateur climbs a mountain, he ties himself well to a trustworthy guide with a strong rope, lest he tumble down to death. So too in the climb to heaven, chaining oneself with the rosary to Mary is a sure way to reach the goal safely and securely no matter how or when death may come to us, as many have found. In the wreckage of a plane, a rosary was found in the hand of Newt Rockney, the famous football coach of Notre Dame. He had been saying it when God called him suddenly to himself. Mary's rosary was found within the white glove of a New York policeman, suddenly shot and killed by a bandit on Fifth Avenue. Such manly devotion often dates from childhood training. At First Holy Communion, the rosary is the traditional Catholic gift to boys and girls. Frequently, this is the beginning of prayerful habits which remain for life. Truly Catholic men always have the rosary in their pocket and move it with their keys and billfold when they change their clothes. In an accident, it's a silent plea that a priest be called. Catholic women feel their purse is not complete unless their rosary is in there somewhere where it can be reached and used in spare moments. At the end of life, the rosary is the final Catholic symbol 
entwined about the fingers of a loved one whom God has called to heaven with himself. The rosary is a convenient prayer and can be said while driving or riding a bus or waiting for sleep, while walking or scrubbing the floor or plowing. The time and place matter not. Even saying the rosary on one's fingers, not using any beads at all, gains a great number of the many rosary indulgences. So one should never fail to say it simply because he has forgotten his beads or for some reason cannot hold them. If from his first communion till he was 75, a man had said a rosary every day, he would have said one and one quarter million times these words. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. And it is certain that God's mother will answer all those prayers, perhaps in some such way as this. Come, my child, to the kingdom where God, my son, has prepared a place for you for all eternity. Little wonder all the recent popes urged the rosary. Pope Pius IX said, If you desire peace in your hearts, in your homes, in your country, assemble every evening to recite the rosary. In the whole of the Vatican, there is not a greater treasure than the rosary. Let the rosary be recited every evening in every household. These are my last words to you, the memorial I leave behind me. Pope Pius X said, No one knew Christ as Mary knew him, and no one can so well lead us to him and make us know him. Pope Pius XI said, The fathers and mothers of families must give an example to their children, especially when at sunset they gather together to recite the rosary on bended knees. This is a beautiful and beneficial custom from which can come only peace and abundance of heavenly gifts for the household. Pope Pius XII urged newly wedded couples to pledge themselves to say the rosary together from the day of their marriage. He realized that the family that prays together stays together. You may be sure that in pledging the daily family rosary, you are ensuring the success of your future family life. Not five, but 15 decades of the rosary, an essential part of the daily schedule of Pope John XXIII, are said by many busy people every day. The name rosary comes from Our Lady's title, Mystical Rose, and describes well the wreath of roses which we daily send to heaven in the form of meditations while saying the Hail Marys and Our Fathers. Originally, the name rosary was used only for the 15 decades while five-decked beads were called corona, or a crown. But now the same name, rosary, is used for both the five and fifteen-decked beads. Rosaries may be made of any material, cheap plastic, wood, solid gold, platinum, or diamonds. However, to be blessed and indulgent, they must be made of something durable and not easily breakable. But in a Nazi concentration camp in Germany during World War II, there was once put together a rosary more precious to Mary, perhaps, than any rosary ever made. A Catholic chaplain of the American Liberating Forces tells the story. When we freed them, I asked these joyful Polish women if they had had any religious services in camp. I knew that the Nazis took away all religious articles from the prisoners. Excitedly, they pushed forward a shy woman who had helped them all very much. And together they told me this story. When Olga was first sent to a concentration camp, she was able to hide her rosary. She said it every day herself and sometimes with groups which secretly came together with her, saying the rosary consoled them all. Gradually it became more than a devotion. The rosary became a precious symbol of their whole faith. 
It was their only visible link with God. But her hidden rosary was discovered and taken away when the camp was moved because of the approaching American army. At that moment, Olga determined more than ever to have a rosary to help keep the faith amidst those inhuman and degrading trials. She searched frantically, but the desolate new camp was absolutely bare of any metal or junk which she could use to make another rosary. They were fed a starvation diet, a piece of black bread or a potato or some watery soup. But the very first meal of a piece of bread suggested an idea to her. She carefully cleaned on her rough prison dress a short, ragged length of string, the fruit of an intense, feverish search. The next day, Olga lovingly divided her small piece of black bread into many tiny sections. She was sure it was served to them in answer to her prayers. She then fixed on the string each tiny piece of the bread, forming it into a hard black pellet. She made a crude cross by tying two twigs of wood with the end of the string. Again, she had a precious rosary of black beads. I tried to tell them of my admiration for her wonderful heroism and piety, but not much would come. And she said to me, Little credit was due to me, Father. Our prayers were necessary for survival. We lived on this rosary. I'll always keep it. It was a wonderful thing for you to give up your meal to make that rosary. Sometimes, Father, prayer and hope are more necessary for life than bread. Prayer, especially the rosary, was the power which Pope Pius V proposed to 16th century Europe to overcome heresy and the infidel. Today, in the 20th century, communism and other evils threaten Christian life and culture. Can a materialistic world protect liberty and the rights of man from those who would destroy them? Mary appeared at Fatima in Portugal, holding a rosary and advocating its use. World War I was at its height. She predicted another worse war would follow unless people prayed and did penance. I am the Lady of the Rosary, and I have come to warn the faithful to amend their lives and ask pardon for their sins. They must continue to say the rosary every day. If today men and families in sufficient numbers daily turn to Mary in the rosary for help and do penance, we have greater reason for confidence that God will deliver us from our dangers, confidence that Russia will be converted and communism completely defeated, as the Turks were defeated at Lepanto. And thus, a new and greater chapter will be written in the Rosary story, when Mary, Queen of the Most Holy Rosary, and help of Christians, will be acknowledged by all as the Queen and Mother of Men. <laughs>